HP 4th Champion Part 2 T was a very sleepy Albus Dumbledore who stepped into the Great Hall on Monday morning. Traveling half the globe in a single day really took it out of a wizard, and Dumbledore hated to admit it sometimes, but he wasn't quite as young as he once was. He had hoped to get a good night's rest, however, his conversation with his potions master, as well as the underlying concerns with the coming new arrival, and the still mysterious reasons for the boy to come out of hiding, had kept his mind working, making sleep nearly impossible. He stopped short when he noticed the noise in the Great Hall. It was not yet seven o'clock, and the Great Hall was already full. Even the student delegations from the visiting schools were already up and enjoying breakfast. Well, they were eating breakfast at least. At once, Dumbledore knew the reason. It was quite apparent as the noise level dropped to dead silence when the students spotted him entering the Great Hall. The old headmaster had to stifle the low chuckle as he made his way to the head table. It was clear that the children would not be able to continue eating, much less anything else until the ultimate question was answered by the school's headmaster. He had planned on giving the announcement when breakfast was nearly over, but it was clear that they would not wait, and if he wanted a peaceful breakfast, he would have to tell them the truth. He happened to catch the eye of Ginny Weasley, who was sitting next to Hermione Granger. Dumbledore had introduced the two himself not long after Ginny had brought the cursed diary to him. Terrified that she was going to be expelled for her hand in the debacle that had plagued the first half of her first year, Dumbledore had recognized the girl's need for a friend, and had observed that Miss Granger had become quite ostracized for her intelligence. Dumbledore felt he had been right in introducing the two girls. They had become very good friends if he wasn't mistaken. He knew he wasn't slash Ginny often talked about the Muggleborns during their sessions. Both girls looked as if they might leap over the table and tackle him to get the truth out of him. In fact, nearly every student looked ready to attack him to find out if the rumor that had clearly spread throughout his school in his absence was true. So, he stepped up to the podium in front of the head table, and turned to face the expectant faces. Good morning. He said, clearing his throat. By now, you have all no doubt heard that the Goblet of Fire chose a fourth champion. I have already contacted our fourth champion, and made arrangements for him to join us here at Hogwarts for the duration of the tournament. He paused here, and watched as students turned to each other, breaths held for the name they all knew was coming. Dumbledore had to admit to feeling a bit wicked in making them wait, but, he had nothing more to say to lengthen the suspense. I know that you've all likely heard who it is, and I am very pleased to confirm that the champion from Salem Academy of Magic in America is none other than Harry Potter. There was a tidal wave of whispers and even a few students shouting if the old headmaster was quite serious. Dumbledore allowed a moment for the students to murmur and mull over this new piece of information. After a few seconds, he went on. I ask you all to refrain from asking him about that fateful night 13 years ago. I have no doubt that any of you would wish to discuss such a painful memory as losing family to complete strangers. Also, it is highly unlikely that he has any memory of the events that took place. As he will be attending classes with many of you, I ask that you treat him as you would any other student. He is no different from any one of you. You will all have the chance to meet him when he arrives this evening. Now, let us carry on as normal. Thank you. The Great Hall erupted in chatter, and Ginny Weasley turned to her best friend Hermione Granger, her eyes as big as dinner plates. I can't believe it. Not only is he really alive like my dad always said, but he's actually coming here. Hermione had never seen Ginny so excited. She was usually a bit more reserved than this, and it made her smile softly. So now we'll have two famous wizards competing, won't your brother be so pleased? Hermione said wryly. Still stinging from what he said the other night. 
Jenny's excitement ebbed away as she watched Hermione's smile fall away as well. It was no secret to anyone that Ronald Weasley, Jenny's older brother by a year hated Hermione, though no one knew the reason. They had been enemies since their first year. Hermione could not figure out what it was she had done wrong, she had only tried to help him and he'd made her seem like some ogre. He'd said some terrible things that had truly hurt the young girl, and it had led to Hermione locking herself in a bathroom where she had cried for hours, missing the Halloween feast. That was the night a mountain troll had somehow found its way into the school. Hermione still got the shakes when she thought about it. She was incredibly lucky that Professor Flitwick had seen the troll enter the girls' lavatory and heard Hermione's shrieks of terror. The diminutive charms teacher had made short work of the troll, and since then, Hermione and Ron had been enemies. Hermione tried to understand it. Fred and George Weasley were very pleasant to her, and Ginny was an angel. Well in comparison. Ginny did have a bit of a wicked streak in her, but it was one of her most endearing qualities. Look, forget about Ron. Ginny said quickly. We have more important things to worry about. Like my runes assignment. Hermione smiled again knowing how Ginny was going to react. As if on cue, Ginny gave a very frustrated growl and rolled her eyes. No. We have to find a way to be friends with Harry Potter so we can lord it over Malfoy. Ginny replied condescendingly, rolling her eyes again for emphasis. I heard him bragging that he and Victor Crumb were becoming the very best of friends. This would really piss him off. What about Harry's feelings? Hermione looked affronted. You're just going to use him to make Malfoy jealous. Of course not. Ginny looked scandalized. I also want to snog him if he's really cute. Hermione stopped short and stared at Ginny who was laughing manically. You're mad, you know that right? Absolutely mad. Ginny and Hermione were not the only girls discussing the re-emergence of the legendary Dark Lord Slayer. At the Ravenclaw table, a group of six girls were leaning in close and discussing the confirmation of the rumor that had been going around, and what Harry Potter might be like. I saw a picture of him in Rise and Fall of the Dark Arts. Sully and short petite Asian girl with very long black hair said to her friends. He was the cutest baby, with the wild tuft of black hair. Sully could be considered the leader of her pack of friends, if she subscribed to that sort of thinking. Sue felt she was no better or no worse than any of the other girls in her Ravenclaw class. But, she was the ring leader in a sense. So he was a cute baby. Padmapadil shrugged. That doesn't mean he's Merlin's gift. For all we know he could make Crab and Goyle look like models or something. Padmapadil was a bit taller than Sue and also had very long black hair, due to her Indian ancestry. Though she was nearly identical to her twin sister Parvati, Padma was a lot more practical, and not nearly as giggly, or gossipy. Whoa. Lisa Turpin said waving her hands wildly. There is no one on this earth, or even this plane of existence that hideous. Even if Potter was horribly scarred, he'd still be much better looking than those overgrown apes. Lisa was tall for her age. She was the tallest girl in her year. The trouble with that was she hadn't really begun developing in any other way. Her mother kept telling her that she was going to be a late bloomer, as she had been, but Lisa felt that this was late enough. She had shoulder-length blonde hair that she usually kept tied in a loose ponytail, or braided. She was often the voice of reason, and the other girls usually came to her first when they had a problem because she was an incredible listener, and didn't pass judgment, no matter what the situation. Okay, true. Padma consented. But what does his looks matter if he's as dumb as a rock? Who wants a boy that you can't even have a conversation with? How good a kisser is he? Aloise Midgen smiled. The other five girls laughed at her joke and she smiled back. 
Eloise was a very sweet girl, though she had a definite weight issue, and a really horrible war going on with acne. She was also incredibly boy crazy, which made for some very interesting conversations late at night in the dorms. Eloise had an older sister who was quite experienced apparently and often passed on stories to her younger sister, who was more than happy to share with her friends. Can I be the first to find out? Morag McDougall laughed, raising her hand. The rather athletically built girl had a very pretty face with a smattering of freckles across her button nose. She had light strawberry blonde hair cut in a very cute pixie-like style. I thought you were going after Kevin. Sue asked, glancing down the table where the boy in question was discussing something with his friend Anthony Goldstein. Well, yeah. But we're not engaged yet. Morag smiled mischievously. Or even together. Aloise pointed out. Details. Morag shouted her down. The point is, a girl is allowed to change her mind, and if Potter strikes my fancy, why should I not allow him the pleasure of kissing me? The girls all laughed again at this, and Morag simply smiled self-righteously. All kidding aside, Mandy Brocklehurst said, looking up at the head table and then back at her dorm mates, her chestnut hair falling over her face a bit. We can speculate all we want, but none of it matters, we'll all see for ourselves tonight. What I think we should be wondering is if we'll have him in any of our classes. I mean, what year is he in? I know he's not a seventh year. Many was very different from her five outgoing friends. She was reserved and soft-spoken. It was nearly the end of their first year before anyone had heard her speak. She was thinner than Morag, but just as tall. Though it was Padma who had begun developing breasts first, Mandy's chest was larger. However, despite how noticeably attractive she was, her shyness prevented her from doing a lot. Unbeknownst to her, her five friends had been conspiring during the summer to try and bring her out of her shell this year, even if it killed her. No, you're right. Lisa said pointing a half-eaten piece of toast at her friend. He was born the same year as me, so he's at least a fourth year. Wait a minute. Sue so said, holding up a hand. How can he even compete in the tournament? I thought the judges made it so only people of age could enter. How did his name even get in the Goblet of Fire? Aloise asked pointedly. He wasn't even here to submit his name. And let's not forget that everyone believed he had died, right? It's all really strange. Padma admitted. Too right it is. Su so said. Come on, we'd better get to class. I'm just telling you all right now, so you don't try anything funny, I'm going to be snogging Potter first. You're right. Lisa grinned. Even if he's a complete troll. He's Harry Potter. So said as if this closed the matter. I'll be able to tell everyone that I snogged him. Luna Lovegood watched her housemates walk by, still laughing about making time with the famous Harry Potter. It was truly amazing how much one could hear, especially when others thought you beneath their notice. Luna was a vibrant girl with long dirty blonde hair that fell nearly to her waist and large protuberant blue eyes that gave her a very dreamy expression. Everyone called her Luna an image she did nothing to dissuade. It was almost Slytherin-like in the way she held onto that facade. It made it so much easier to really get a look at who people truly were. Luna found it fascinating that the girls would be so interested in getting physical with a boy they'd never seen much less talk to. It made Luna wonder idly if maybe kissing Harry Potter might imbibe the recipient with special power, or give them second sight, or any number of abilities. This was of course ridiculous, but one could never be sure about anything, as her father would often say. Luna was most intrigued by the idea that Harry had not only survived that fateful night 13 years ago, but had been hidden. This was a very curious bit of information. The Dark Lord had been vanquished, 
hadn't he? Without a leader his followers had been rounded up or hid themselves away, and Harry would have been protected and cared for, so why was the magical world led to believe that he had died? What also puzzled her was a question her housemates had posed. Why was Harry even being allowed to compete in the tournament age limit had been set at 17? Why were they making an exception, unless Harry was the second coming of Merlin himself, and the ministry wished to show off Harry like some sort of trophy? But then again, why was he hidden all this time? Luna wondered if Harry himself knew the answers to these questions. Unfortunately, she was going to have to wait just like everybody else at Hogwarts for her answers. Getting to her feet, Luna hefted her school bag and headed off to the greenhouses. She hoped Ginny Weasley was saving her a spot. She really liked Ginny, she made classes so fun. E.E.T. is exciting, out. But is also unfair. Fleur said forcefully as she and her best friend Claudia followed the other Bose Batten students to the carriage. This tournament has become nothing more than a circus that we now have no choice but to participate in. How can you believe that? Claudia asked. No one was told of a fourth champion. And if I am not mistaken, this Harry Potter is not even of age. I overheard that Mr. Bagman saying that he was 13 or 14. He is barely older than Gabrielle. The girl in question looked at her sister, who had clearly forgotten that she was right beside her, and glared. Excuse me. Gabrielle said, her voice dripping with venom. I may be 13, but we both know that I am quite capable of. I am not insulting you, Gabby. I am simply stating that someone of your age is not ready to participate in such an contest. I am 17, and I do not believe myself ready for such trials. It feels like this is some big production for something else. Madame Maxine does not seem to be worried over this development, I do not see that you should be either. Besides, what can you do? Claudia asked, looking bored with the conversation. Nothing. Fleur said simply, though she clearly looked upset. I will simply have to do my best and bring home the Triwizard Cup for dear Bo's Batten. Gabrielle simply smirked at her sister's bravado. She had little doubt the other two champions were not boasting their claims of winning at this very moment as well. You've asked that question six times now. Susan Bone smiled at her dreamy-eyed friend, Hannah Abbott. Susan had deep red hair and a very ample bosom. She had a very pale complexion and big bright brown eyes. Her friend, Hannah was blonde, though built very similar, though slightly taller. Yeah but come on. Hannah said. We've both seen the pictures of his dad, and he was a pretty good looking guy, and his mother was gorgeous. Not to mention what a cute baby he was. Yes, and I already said that I'm more than a bit curious. But let's be cool, and not fall all over him like some air-headed fangirl. Do you really think that will impress him? Besides, every single girl in this school is going to be thinking the same way you are. He's just another boy until he proves otherwise, so stop drooling and let's get to class before McGonagall has kittens. What do you think Professor Sprout wanted with Cedric? Hannah posed the question as they rounded the corner that lead to the Transfiguration Courtyard and their first class. I don't know, I wasn't close enough to hear, but did you see his face? He looked really nervous. Susan remarked. It's probably something to do with the tournament. Hannah shrugged. I can't wait to see Cedric in action. Maybe we'll get lucky and his shirt will get ripped off in the first task. Oh my gods, you are so obsessed. Susan looked scandalized. You see him one time. One time without his shirt and it's all you can talk about for nearly two years. Trust me. Hannah said, grabbing her friend's arm, if you had seen what I saw you'd feel the same way. Whatever. Come on we've got to. 
Susan stopped short when she saw the two men and a boy with black hair heading down the corridor towards them. The first man had shoulder-length black hair and a well-trimmed goatee. The second man she recognized from the previous year. It was their former defense teacher, Professor Lupin. Hannah. Susan hissed, her eyes glued to the boy between the two men. Susan felt Hannah's grip tighten on her arm and knew that she must be thinking the very same thing. They were looking at Harry Potter. He was a bit taller than the both of them, thin, but no too skinny. His hair was raven black and short and rather messy looking, though it was rather charming. He was looking into the courtyard, a soft smile on his face. He had a thin red scar on his forehead just over his right eye that looked a lot like a bolt of lightning. As he got closer to the two of them, he turned and caught their eyes, and gave a warm, appreciative smile as he passed, even turning to look at them over his shoulder. Both Hannah and Susan were instantly enthralled by those sparkling emerald green eyes, and neither of them took a breath as he passed them. Both girls were deathly silent as the trio passed and when the men were out of sight, the girls let out a long slow breath. Okay. Susan said softly. He's hot. Oh yeah. Hannah agreed. It was a few seconds before they remembered they were supposed to be in class, and ended up slipping into McGonagall's class just as the bell rang. It wouldn't be until lunch that they would learn that they were the first Hogwarts students to set eyes on the new arrival. Dumbledore finished his breakfast quickly, and just before he left the Great Hall, asked Professor Sprout to send Cedric Diggory to see him after the meal, excusing him from classes for the day. Dumbledore had thought it would be a good idea for Harry to have a guide around the castle for a few days, and felt it best it be the Hogwarts champion as they would have at least something in common. He was also hopeful that Diggory might introduce Harry to some of the fourth-year students, and Cedric was very popular and had associations in every house, one of the few students who did. Dumbledore didn't wish Harry to only befriend children from one house, as seemed to be the case with most of his students. Dumbledore wondered just what the student populace might be feeling now. Harry Potter the hero who vanquished the Dark Lord, was long believed dead, though he had been celebrated as a hero. Dumbledore had actually heard a few of the bedtime stories that these children had likely heard growing up after the war. While none of the tales Dumbledore had heard painted Harry as some sort of godlike being, they did manage to make the child look quite powerful and brave. Dumbledore had always feared that that sort of thing might be too much for the boy. He could have become overconfident and reckless, trying to live up to his legend. Or, he might have gone the other way, and tried to use that fame to get his heart's desire, eventually succumbing to greater temptations, and forever losing himself to darkness. The boy he had met only two days ago was humble, and charming, in his way. He was exactly what one might expect a boy only just 14 to be though Dumbledore could not deny the obvious influence of the boy's godfather. Dumbledore knew that Harry was quite intelligent, and gifted with magic. He had no doubt in his mind that the boy's godfather had been teaching the boy from an early age, and Harry still had untapped potential. But, Harry was still a boy, and deserved to have as normal a childhood as could be afforded to him. It was for this reason that Dumbledore was so frustrated at the situation. No one should have known the boy was alive. Not until it needed to be known. The answer to the puzzle was there, just out of reach. Dumbledore hoped that perhaps after Harry was at the school, something would happen that would give Dumbledore the answer he sought, and with luck. Before it was too late to prevent what the old headmaster feared had been building since that Halloween night. A knock upon his office door broke him from his thoughts and brought him back to the present. Enter. He called, and was unsurprised to see Cedric Diggory, along with his head of house, Pomona Sprout. Ah, Mr. Diggory, thank you for coming. I have a favor to ask of you. 
I intend to excuse you from all classes today so that you may play tour guide and host for Mr. Potter. I would like you to show him the grounds, and the castle. I wish for him to be kept away from the rest of the students as much as possible, at least until dinner this evening. Of course, Professor. Cedric said with his customary half-smile. But, why me? Surely someone closer to his age would be more appropriate. Perhaps. But, you and Harry have at least one thing in common. You are both champions in the Triwizard Tournament. I hope that during the day, you might find more things in common, and perhaps even form a friendship. You will of course remember what I told you this Friday last. Cedric nodded, and Dumbledore smiled. Another knock came and upon Dumbledore's word, the door opened, and Cedric got his first look at the boy of legend. Cedric was thoroughly gobsmacked. He didn't exactly know what the vanquisher of he who must not be named would look like, but never in his life would he have expected anything like what came through the headmaster's door. He was about average height for any fourth-year boy, with a thin build, and a light complexion. He had a mop of thick black hair that stuck out here and there as if he'd only just awoken and neglected to comb it. His eyes were a startling green, that roamed the office in excited curiosity, and a thin lightning bolt-shaped scar on his forehead, hovering above his right eye. Ah, very good, right on time. Dumbledore smiled, rising from his desk to shake hands with both Harry and the two men who'd entered with him, who Dumbledore introduced as Sirius Black. Cedric had already met Remus Lupin, but shook his hand anyway, happy to see the man once again. Sorry for our lateness, but Remus and I thought it'd be fun to give Harry a quick tour. Sirius smiled at Harry, who was obviously enjoying the headmaster's office. He was trying to take in everything, from the portraits of previous heads, to the small table overflowing with tiny silver instruments. Not to worry. Dumbledore smiled. I imagine the two of you rather enjoyed pointing out to young Harry some of the best places to hide should he be looking to escape some diabolical prank. Both Remus and Sirius blushed slightly, though they laughed at Dumbledore's joke. At least, Cedric thought it was a joke. Black was an interesting person, who after being introduced and shaking hands with the Hufflepuff champion, then embraced Professor Sprout, exclaiming how delightful it was to see her once again. Sprout blushed, while claiming Black had not changed at all since he'd been at Hogwarts. Dumbledore then introduced Harry to both Sprout and Cedric, and after a quick explanation of his wishes for the two of them, allowed them to be on their way. Followed by Professor Sprout who had a class to teach. I'll ask Alastair to watch over him. Dumbledore said, watching Sirius stare at the door where Harry and the older boy had left through. I have real faith in that kid, Albus, I really do. But he's not ready for this. Sirius turned around to look at his old headmaster. He won't sit out, or half-ass it either, it's not in his nature. He's just like Lily in that respect. Ah, yes. I do remember how tenacious she could be. Dumbledore smiled fondly. I will do my very best to protect him as much as I can, but I am quite limited as I am one of the judges. But Alastair will be able to watch him quite closely. You will be able to see him on the weekends, and during the tasks. Also, as you are not a teacher, nor a judge, the both of you will be able to impart any knowledge to him you feel beneficiary. Any clues on how this happened yet? Remus asked. None I am afraid. Dumbledore sighed. My best guess is that our mutual friend Peter Pettigrew somehow found out about the tournament and slipped into the castle and entered Harry's name. It fits except for one thing. Remus said flatly. He wouldn't have known Harry was alive. Sirius finished the thought. Not unless he was working with someone who did know, and until we can find him and question him, I am afraid we are stuck. Dumbledore said, steepling his fingers. 
So, do you have any ideas where out little rat friend might be hiding? Sirius asked, leaning forward in his seat, a glint of undisguised malice in his dark eyes. Hogwarts was far more spectacular than Harry had ever imagined it to be. And at the same time, rather blander. He'd grown up hearing about the magnificent castle and all its wonders. As he walked alongside Cedric Diggory, Harry was simultaneously awed, and let down. Yet, he was still filled with excitement. He was in the heart of the setting for every single story Sirius had ever told him. There were so many things he wanted to see for himself. Cedric was a very patient companion, taking Harry everywhere he asked to be shown. The Whomping Willow, which Harry explained hid a secret passage that led to the Shrieking Shack which was in fact not haunted at all. The Great Hall where his father had made a fool of himself over and over again trying to gain his mother's favor. The Astronomy Tower, the Kitchens, the restricted section of the library, the hospital wing. All the places he'd heard so much about while growing up, they were now being shown to him to his great wonder and awe. While they walked about, Harry and Cedric talked, and to the Hufflepuff's great pleasure, found that Harry was a truly interesting guy. Not only were they both champions in the tournament, but both played seeker on their respective Quidditch teams. They even discussed the possibility of putting together a pickup game in the coming weeks just for fun. Where's your race course? Harry asked as they approached the Quidditch pitch. What? Cedric looked confused. You do have a broom race league right? Harry looked as if Cedric were putting him on. You have a race league in America. Wait a minute. Harry halted, holding up his hands. You're telling me you don't have a broom racing league here? How can you not have broom racing? It's amazing. Harry then went on to explain all about broom racing and how exciting it was and how he had landed himself a spot on Salem's team after a very interesting Quidditch match. They use hoops similar to the ones in Quidditch, only a bit bigger and there's a ton of them you have to fly through. If you miss on you get docked in your overall time. It can get really physical, especially if a bunch of you are together. I got knocked out of the air by Francis Parker my second race. I spent two nights in the hospital while my shattered leg was regrown. By the way, Skel GRO. Poison. There's no other word to describe it. Cedric laughed at Harry's joke, and they walked around the pitch so Harry could see how different it was to the one at his school. Cedric himself was very intrigued to learn that Harry's school went all year round. As Harry explained it, they stayed in classes for around three months and then got two weeks off and then they returned. At the end of August, they would sit exams and then, if they performed well, they would be advanced into the next year. I think it's so we don't end up forgetting stuff when we can't practice for three months at a time. Harry suggested when Cedric asked why Salem Academy didn't have a summer break. They were interrupted in their discussion when they came upon the tallest man Harry had ever beheld in his life. Though he'd never met him in his life, Harry knew exactly who he was looking at. You're Hagrid. Harry said with amazement. Hagrid turned around and appraised the young man before him. I, and who are yet? Hagrid said rather shortly. Oh, I'm so sorry. Harry smiled offering his hand. I'm Harry Potter, sir. Hagrid's beetle black eyes widened as he reached out one of his trash bin lid sized hands and shook Harry's. My word, are ye really? Well it's a great pleasure to met yet. Knew your mother and father, I did. I know. My godfather Sirius Black always speaks very highly of you. Sirius Black you say, no kidding. I thought he died. No one's heard from him since. Well a long time. Hagrid beamed. Then a strange noise made the mountain of a man turn suddenly. So sorry, but I have to prepare for me class. Hagrid said apologetically. 
What are you teaching this year, Hagrid? Cedric asked, coming around to see what it was making the strange noise. Blast ended Scroots. Hagrid beamed proudly. I've never heard of them. Harry admitted, looking at the strange lobster-like creatures. Very rare. Hagrid said, stuttering a bit. Harry thought he could just make out a blush on Hagrid's cheeks, though there was so much hair, he couldn't be sure. Well, I got to get ready fo me next class. Harry, I'd really like it if we could have tea sometime. I knew your mother and father pretty well, and I'd be happy to share some stories, and get to know ya a bit better, if you'd like tha is. I think I'd like that. Syria said you were one of a kind. Harry smiled, and Hagrid beamed again. Hagrid puffed out his chest a bit and smiled. Always did like tha Sirius. Cedric and Harry said goodbye and continued on their way. The conversation turned to the more colorful characters around the school, especially the teachers and students. The bell tolled, signaling the end of class. The hall suddenly filled with students journeying towards their next lessons. Yet, everyone was talking about Harry Potter. Do you think he's already here? Tracy Davis asked, angrily flipping her uncooperative auburn hair out of her face. She'd been at war with her lock since the summer when her mother had insisted on giving her a haircut. Tracy had wanted something special and her mother insisted that she could do exactly as Tracy wanted. It had ended badly, and what was worse was her mother refused to take her to Diagon Alley to get it fixed. I have absolutely no idea, do I? Daphne Greengrass said. Holding her books tightly to her chest and keeping a wary eye on Theodore Knott who'd been eyeing her all through class as if she was something to be conquered. She flipped her blonde hair over her shoulder and turned to look at her best friend. But he'll be here at dinner so you'll just have to wait until then. Do you think he's coming with someone from his school, or by himself? I mean, Dumbledore said he'd be attending classes with us, but the other schools aren't coming to classes with us, so I was. Tracy ran into Daphne's arm, and grunted. She turned ready to admonish her friend, but Daphne's usually stony gaze was gone replaced by a rather dreamy expression. Well, dreamy for Daphne. Tracy turned and followed her friend's gaze and found that she was staring at Cedric Diggory who was talking to that horrible Cho Chang girl, and her curly-haired friend whose name Tracy couldn't recall. But more importantly was the boy standing next to Cedric, shaking hands with the curly-haired girl and smiling politely, nodding as he listened to the girls and Cedric. Tracy's breath caught in her chest as she saw the boy's eyes. Two perfect green orbs shone like emeralds in the sun, and got impossibly bright when he laughed at something Cho said. Is that Potter? Pansy Parkinson had pulled up next to Tracy and Daphne and was actually wrinkling her nose. Both Tracy and Daphne turned to look at the girl as if she were out of her mind. Pansy was looking Potter up and down appraisingly, and obviously not liking what she saw. However, Millicent Bolstrode, who stood behind her, and being much taller than Pansy looked as if Harry was a very tasty piece of chocolate and she was starving. I don't see what's so special about him. Pansy shrugged. But I bet if he and Draco become friends, you'll be falling over yourself just to get his approval, won't you? Daphne said loftily. Jealousy doesn't look good on you green grass. You'll do well to remember he offered you a chance to be his last year, and you scoffed at him. Pansy smirked as if she had just won the non-existent argument. As I recall, she need his jewels. Tracy said as though remembering something very pleasing. Whatever. Pansy snorted. Let's go Millie. Pansy commanded and began to head for class. We'd better get going too. Daphne said, her icy mask falling back into place. If we hurry, we can walk by him. Tracy didn't need any more encouragement, 
and as she passed him, she actually caught his eye. He held her gaze, and gave a sweet smile that actually made Tracy giggle uncharacteristically. Daphne had far too much fun the rest of the day imitating the moment, and Tracy vowed not to invite her to hers and Harry's wedding. I knew you were going to be popular. But I had no idea that girls would be going out of their way to get a glimpse of you. Cedric grinned broadly as he and Harry began heading into the Great Hall for an early lunch. I have to admit, I'm a little frightened by all the attention. Harry admitted. But at the same time, having so many girls smiling at you is kind of cool. I noticed quite a few of them checking you out as well. Cedric stopped short and looked at Harry, who shrugged. What? I thought you knew and were just ignoring it. Besides, with a girl like Cho, why would you bother noticing anyone else? Good point, you mind if I use that if I get in trouble with her? If you think it'll help. Harry smiled as they took their seats. Listen, at dinner tonight, why don't you sit at the Hufflepuff table and I'll introduce you to some of the people in your year. That way you won't feel awkward with people staring at you. I mean, I know you can sit wherever you want and all, but I thought it'd make things a bit easier for you, you know. Thanks. I'll do that. Can you tell me about some of them before I meet them? Cedric began telling Harry all he knew of the nine fourth-year kids of his house. Harry listened as Cedric told him their names and a little about each one. This conversation led to Cedric telling Harry about all the fourth-year students he knew of and it expanded to other students and teachers culminating in a discussion about the penultimate Quidditch team. If I could make the perfect team, I'd pull Katie Bell and Alicia Spinett from Grapender, and Thomas Bradley from Ravenclaw for the Chasers, the Weasley Twins as Beaters, my own keeper, Regina Summers, and myself as Seeker. I think that team would be unbeatable. Why no Slytherins? I thought you said they'd won the cup for the last ten years. Harry asked. To be honest, I don't know if any of them have any real talent. You see, they're extremely good at cheating. Ever since Draco Malfoy got on the team two years ago, it's gotten really out of hand. I feel like there might be some truly gifted players, but I've yet to see it. I'd be interested in seeing them play. Harry said. Watching a team play can teach you a lot about what kind of people they are. At least that's what my godfather says. I wouldn't ever tell him this, but he's actually right. Someone who has to cheat is obviously overcompensating for something else that might be lacking in their lives. I've actually seen it for myself. Interesting theory. I might have to pay a bit more attention in the future. Cedric admitted. Okay, so I've met your girlfriend Cho, and Marietta, who's pretty scrumptious. Scrumptious. Cedric asked, trying not to laugh too hard. There was this guy at Salem who graduated last year, and he always called pretty girls scrumptious. Some of us just started using it. I'm not sure, but I reckon Marietta might actually like being called scrumptious. Well, I'd never say it to her face. Harry said, blushing. She might kill me. Anyway, what are the other girls like? Who do I need to check out? Cedric grinned broadly and the two boys began talking girls, a universal subject for all teenaged boys. Harry was now on the edge of his seat as he listened to Cedric talk about his girlfriend, Cho Chang. And her best friend Marietta Edge come in more detail before mentioning other girls like Katie Bell, Alicia Spinett, Angelina Johnson, Lavender Brown, Daphne Greengrass, Samantha Fawcett, Patricia Stimson, Leanne King, the Pottle Twins, Susan Bones, Hannah Abbott, Sully, Sally and Perks, and of course the Ravenclaws are the brainiest kids, but if you really need help with your studying, you should find Hermione Granger. She's in Grapender, but she is tops in her year, 
and she could put a lot of the seventh years to shame. Is she pretty? Harry asked, a roguish smile on his face, and Cedric had to grin as well. Have I mentioned anyone I felt was not pretty? Cedric chuckled, and Harry smiled as well. He was really liking Cedric. He was so easygoing. In a lot of ways, he reminded Harry of Sirius. She's got a hair problem. I don't mean she's Harry all over or anything. She's just got this untamable mess of curls. But I tell you what, by next year, she's going to start breaking hearts around here and people who made fun of her, like that complete idiot, Ron Weasley. Are going wish they'd been nice to her from the beginning. That's the fourth Weasley you've mentioned. How many of them are there? Harry asked. They were currently walking through the fifth floor corridor and Cedric was showing Harry some interesting shortcuts around the castle. Currently, there are four. The twins, Fred and George, though how you tell them apart is beyond me. Good for a laugh those two. Always manage to brighten any day. Last year after Grafender lost a match against Slytherin, all the members of the Slytherin team showed up for breakfast the next morning. And as they passed through the doors of the Great Hall their clothes disappeared, but they were all wearing very frilly ladies' underwear. No one got punished for it, but everyone, including the teachers I think, knew that Fred and George were behind it. They're legends. Anyway, Ron's next. He's in your year, I think. I really don't know a lot about him other than he got in serious trouble for fighting two Slytherins last year. And finally the youngest, Ginny, who's a third year, and personally I think is going to be the school's biggest heartbreaker if she hasn't started already. She's fiery, and I don't just mean her hair. I saw her do a really complicated hex on someone who insulted her friend on the train. It was pretty damned wicked. Any people I should avoid? Harry asked. I can't tell you that. I think you should be friends with whomever you want. There's a lot of house division, which I can't figure out. I don't know why people think they should only associate with people in their own houses. By sixth year, most people figure it out for themselves, so you see people in sixth and seventh year hanging out no matter what house they're in, but fifth year and below, especially Slytherin. More or less isolate themselves. It's really stupid. The only person I might warn you against is Draco Malfoy. You've mentioned that name a bunch. And every time it was something negative. Is he really that bad? Harry looked over, watching Cedric's face. Sirius had taught him that you could learn a lot about people based on their expressions. Right now it looked like Cedric was trying to find a nice way to say some pretty bad things. The more time he spent with him, the more Harry liked Cedric. This guy didn't seem to have a nasty bone in his body. Plus, he was easy to talk to. Harry hoped they might become lifelong friends like Remus and Sirius. Well, for one thing, his father, Lucius is pretty powerful. And petty. He's got the minister's ear, and whatever he wants done, he can make it happen. They're extremely rich, and it's something Draco loves to lord over people he believes to be beneath him, which is pretty much everyone in the school. Teachers included. Cedric explained as they began heading back to the castle. Is Draco like really powerful or something? I mean magically. Harry queried as they took another secret passage hidden behind a portrait of twelve friars making wine. This led to a staircase that emptied out on the second floor right near the hospital wing. Not that I've seen. He threatens a lot, but I've never actually seen him cast. As least, not while someone was facing him. He's an opportunist, to be sure. Always makes sure the odds are in his favor. So he's a bully, then. Harry posed. No question. Why hasn't anyone done anything about him? 
Surely someone could put him in his place. It's been talked about, but you remember me telling you about Professor Snape. Harry nodded and Cedric smiled. He's the head of Slytherin House, and he's quite biased towards the little snakes. I will say this for the man, he's truly gifted at potions, I just wish he was a better teacher. It's like he leaves steps out of his direction so you're guaranteed to screw it up. Got it? Harry nodded. Ah, Mr. Diggory and Mr. Potter. The boys turned to find a tall thin woman who Harry swore looked as if she'd been sucking on lemons. She was very stern looking, though her voice sounded friendly enough. I have been looking for you both for nearly an hour. I've just been showing Harry around, Professor. Harry Potter, this is Professor McGonagall, she teaches Transfiguration and is the head of Gryffindor House. Cedric smiled as he made the introductions. Professor, it's an honor. Harry said taking the thin hand of the Transfiguration teacher. You played pretty prominently in all of my godfather's stories. Of that I have no doubts, Mr. Potter. I hope you do not share his or your father's love for mischief-making. Time will tell, I'm sure. Cedric couldn't be sure, but he swore he saw McGonagall's lip twitch towards a smile. But it was gone in an instant, and she simply stared at Harry. I have been sent to collect you for the headmaster. He wishes to speak with you before you are introduced to the school. If you'd follow me. Mr. Diggory, you may head back to your common room if you'd like. Thank you, Professor. I'll see you at dinner, Harry. Harry reached out a hand and shook Cedric's. Thanks for everything, said. Save me a seat. You got it. Cedric gave a small bow to the professor before turning and heading away. Harry turned and began following McGonagall through the halls. He'd seen so much of the school, but he still felt lost, much like he had in his first few weeks at Salem. He knew that he'd eventually get used to it, and he had no doubt that he'd make some friends who'd be glad to help him out, so he wasn't too worried. Besides, he now possessed that very handy map. How are you enjoying Hogwarts so far? Professor McGonagall asked. To be perfectly honest, it isn't exactly how I pictured it. Sirius always said it looked like this gleaming jewel, or however he put it. I, it was, and will be again. You see, Hogwarts thrives on the magic of its students. Before the last war, this school housed thousands of students compared to the roughly 500 we have now. The generation born during war. Many families were lost forever before the you-know-who fell. Ooh. Harry looked up suddenly, and McGonagall looked back in surprise at the boy's expression. My word, I thought you knew. Dumbledore said that you had been told all about the wizard who killed you parents. Oh. Harry's eyes lit up with recognition. You mean Voldemort? McGonagall gave a strangled squeak, and stumbled a bit, much to Harry's own shock. We do not speak his name. McGonagall said firmly, trying to get her composure back. Why? Harry asked looking thoroughly confused now. It's just a name. A really stupid one at that. I don't suppose you would really understand. Those were truly terrible times. No, I get that. It's just that by being afraid to say a stupid name like Voldemort, Harry noticed McGonagall stumble again. Just gives it more power over you, doesn't it? Besides, he's dead, so you're actually letting his memory have power over you, and that's just plain idiotic. Hmm. It's no wonder why Dumbledore is so fond of you. You sound a lot like him. McGonagall said with a sniff. Termite toffee. Harry hadn't realized it, but they had made their way to the stone gargoyle that guarded the headmaster's office in hardly any time at all. The headmaster is expecting you. I shall see you at dinner, 
and in my class. Good evening. Thank you, Professor. Harry said as he climbed the spiral staircase and knocked upon the headmaster's door. Enter. Ah, Harry. How are you? Did you have an informative day? Dumbledore smiled as he rose from his seat. Yes, I did, sir thank you. Cedric was really nice and I met his girlfriend and another girl as well. Cedric said he'd introduce me to some of my classmates at dinner tonight. Very good, very good indeed. Well, I thought I might show you to your quarters and we might have a chance to speak. Then we shall go to dinner. Is that acceptable? I'd be honored, sir. So polite. It's a very good quality to find in one so young. Sirius made sure to show me how using simple politeness and respect can get you further in life. It also makes it easier to deal with unpleasant people a lot of times. Harry said with a smile. That it does. Dumbledore nodded as he waved Harry towards the door. Sirius has a very good point. It may also give you a chance to understand that unpleasant individual. He failed to mention that. Harry shrugged. But it's gotten me out of a few rather um. Sticky situations at school. I see. Dumbledore smiled. Well, I do hope that you do not find yourself in any sticky situations here at Hogwarts. Dumbledore's eyes twinkled, and Harry smiled. I think it's a bit late for that, don't you sir? I mean, I'm taking part in what I'm told is a very dangerous tournament. Harry pointed out. Dumbledore had to agree. Indeed. I wish for you to know how truly sorry I am that I could not fix this for you. I did try to find some loophole, but the magic surrounding the selection process is very old, and quite binding. I have every intention of discovering who is behind this conspiracy and find out who they knew you to be alive and hidden. In the meantime, I hope that you work very hard to get through each task. It'd be more helpful if I knew what the tasks were. Harry pointed out, and Dumbledore nodded his agreement. I'm sure it would be most helpful, though I am bound to secrecy. As I am also bound to be unable to assist you, which is most unfortunate. However, you may ask your fellow champions for assistance as well as any of your new friends. Sirius and Mr. Lupin would be most willing to help in any way they can as well. Ah, here we are. Harry saw a rather ornate door with a wrought iron knocker upon it. These will be your quarters while here at Hogwarts for the year. To set the password, simply tap your wand to the knocker and whisper it. Then. All you need do is say the password anytime you wish to enter. I do recommend changing the password every few months. Now, I think it is very close to dinner. Shall we? They turned and began heading back towards the Great Hall. Sir, I was wondering something. Well, I've wanted to know for a long time, but Sirius never had the answer, and I was hoping that you might. Dumbledore cocked his head and waited for Harry to continue. Why did Voldemort try and kill me that night? What has Sirius told you on this subject? Dumbledore asked and Harry shrugged. Only that my parents had to go into hiding and that Voldemort wanted to get me. Then we were betrayed by Wormtail, and he found us. He says it's a miracle that I survived and that no one has ever survived the killing curse but he never knew why it all happened. Interesting. Dumbledore said thoughtfully. What is? Your godfather and father were as close as brothers. What is interesting is that your father never told Sirius the reason they needed to go into. Hiding. I had thought for sure that James would have confided in Sirius. It is clear that he wished to protect his friend as much as he wished to protect his family. But why, sir? Dumbledore sighed heavily. He stopped just short of the entrance hall and turned to Harry. 
It is a very long story, Harry, and while it is clearly your right to know it all, I'm afraid that now is not the time. But, I will make you a promise right here. At the end of the year, you, Sirius and myself will sit down together, and I will tell you everything I know of the events that led to that night. I will even try and convince a few others who were involved to join us as they will have unique insights that may help us unravel a few mysteries. Is that acceptable to you? Harry's shoulders fell a bit, realizing he was not being dismissed and that obviously everyone's concern was for him to make it through the year in one piece. Harry wondered just how bad this story was, and thought that it might be a good thing Dumbledore didn't wish to tell it to him just yet. All right, sir when the tournament is over, and done with, we'll speak about this again. Dumbledore offered his hand, and Harry took it. He felt a warmth rush through him and realized that Dumbledore had just sworn to tell him everything without speaking the oath. Harry's opinion of the man just rose in leaps and bounds. Well then, I think it is time to formally introduce you to the student body. I ask that you await the announcement, then you may come in and take a seat. Enjoy your dinner, Harry. And with that, Dumbledore entered the Great Hall while Harry awaited to be introduced. Please like and subscribe.